The Science of Sports podcast with Professor Ross Tucker and sports journalist Mike Finch. Revealing the truth behind the games we play. Coming up in this episode. How is there possibly confusion between a man and a woman? Our job for the next 45 minutes to an hour is to try and move that stuff aside. And because of that selection of events, it must be targeted at Semenya. As the IAAF, you do have an obligation to ensure fairness. It has been one of the most dramatic weeks in the world of athletics and perhaps in the world of sport. There have been accusations of racism and human rights groups have got involved. But in amongst it all, a 28-year-old double Olympic and three-time world champion may never be able to run competitively again. Welcome to the Science of Sport podcast with myself, Mike Finch, and Professor Ross Tucker. So this week, the Court of Arbitration for Sport rules against Casa Semenya in a case against the International Association of Athletics Federations. And there's been a lot of talk this week about uh, this very dramatic case. Lots of drama, lots of emotion, lots of reaction to it, not only in South Africa, but around the world. And it means, effectively, that uh, Casta Semenya's future in the sport it might well be in doubt. We may never see her race on the track again. Ross Tucker, your reaction? Well, to the verdict, I was disappointed and stunned, to be honest. I, I suppose in hindsight, now that it's been a couple of days, we, and by we, just for disclosure, I was part of the team that testified at that court case in support of Casta Semenya's case. I think we'd convinced ourselves so much that we, of the merits of our case that we fully expected to win. Mm. Maybe guilty, a little bit of confirmation bias. We'd immersed ourselves for five or six months in the arguments that we were going to present, and we were really sure that they were strong. You know, we went there to present a case for why the evidence supporting the guideline was inadequate poor quality, failed to do the job that it would have needed to do. And I was really confident we'd win. So for, for the last two months, I've been thinking ahead to this podcast and how I was going to explain the decision and so forth. And then by Tuesday night, I was like, oh, man, we've got to rethink all of this. How, we, how did we lose? So disappointed, uh, surprised, and then disappointed for her and for all the other athletes who will now be affected by this because they are more than just her. And I, I don't know where this goes next. So just to kind of explain the decision, uh, the, the courts um, ruled that the Casta Semenya's case against the RWF means that she now has to take medication to reduce her levels of testosterone. I mean, if you've, if you've been living in la-la land or had your head stuck in the sand the last couple of days, you probably wouldn't have heard about this, but it has been in, in, in South African newspapers on the front page. We've seen um, interviews that Ross has done across many of the international networks, TV networks. It's a global story, but essentially means that she has to take the medication, and there are lots of issues around that, which we'll get into a little bit later. But she has now lost the case, which means she either has to take the medication so she compete in her favorite events, or she can compete in events that do not are not covered in this ruling, um, which are not her speciality events. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, pretty much. She's got two legal options and three performance options. The legal options are binary. She challenges it or she, or she accepts it. If she challenges it, then she leaves the sports legal system and she has to go to a choice of the Swiss Federal Tribunal, potentially European Human Rights Court. I'm not sure. That's a legal aspect I... <laughs> won't pretend to know much about We're just sports scientists on this podcast on the, while you are. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like a, a TV lawyer having sat through this and read so much, but I'm not going to give you secondhand information, <laughs> rather. The performance side, I, I'll, I'll say a little more clearly, uh, she's got three options. One is she can stay where she is, 800, 1500, but in order to do that, she has to take the medication or have surgery in order to be eligible according to the policy that is now finalized yeah um, and there's no subsequent challenge to that within this court by the way the second option she has is she can run distances not covered by the regulation so that means she could go down to 200 or she could go up to 3000 and 5000 and then the third option is that she can just say you know what i've had 10 years of this i'm done i'm out i'm walking away thanks for the memories and the <laughs> the problems, and then retire. Yeah. So she's got those three options. I don't know what she's going to do. I've seen people suggest both extremes, retirement versus challenge. I don't know her mind. Uh, that's the next installment. So the last couple of days, you've probably done more interviews around this uh, around this case than you've probably ever done in your life. You've been on the phone virtually every single day from early in the morning. What has the reaction been not only here in South Africa but globally to the story? 
Well, in South Africa, it's obviously colored uh, enormously by patriotic bias, quote unquote, and support. I mean, bias isn't always bad. I think it's a lot of people supporting her case. I don't think they always know why, they, <laughs> why they're supporting her case other than to support, which is fine. Uh, globally, I think most people were surprised. Yeah. You know, the, what was it, four years ago now, 2015, a similar court case was heard by the same court. And the decision in that instance, and I suppose in order to understand this, we will have to get into that, was that there was insufficient evidence and they were going to set it aside. And it seemed to me that the prevailing wind direction socially, societally, is for more inclusion and to not discriminate. And so when Cass said this is discriminatory, but that it's reasonable, that it's justified and it's proportionate, that was a surprise because I figured that the, the inertia of the system seemed to be going that way and all of a sudden mm. we've gone this way on this. So I think the rest of the world is surprised, trying to understand it, uh, because certainly the decision we saw had certain uh, schizophrenic properties. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's confusion and there's surprise. And then there's, of course, there are some people who are saying, good on the IWF, well done, you've stood up for women's sports and this is the right decision to have reached. I mean, it's amazing just here in South Africa, and obviously we're a country with a, a very tarnished history in many ways, so it has become a political issue. And uh, some, of the, uh, some of the quotes that we've seen from the local political organisations calling the ANC calling it appalling, uh, for probably reasons that they don't really understand scientifically, but from a human rights perspective, they see that. We've seen uh, trade unions uh, going out on a limb and talking about it. So anybody who's got an opinion has said something about this case and often misinformed about the case, although, although we have seen a lot of the journalists that have interviewed in the me and the radio talk show hosts have interviewed you have uh, really done their research because there is a huge amount of interest in this. I've been actually pleasantly surprised by the quality of the questions that some of the media are asking. I think they've had, in fairness, 10 years of exposure to the Casta Semenya <laughs> controversy. So if people have learned. 10 years ago, people were incredulous that this was even a question. How was yeah. there possibly confusion between a man and a woman? I think now people are a lot wiser and a lot more informed about the, the complexities of biological sex. So the questions have been good. It's the spokespeople and the campaigners and the crusaders that are, in my opinion, doing it a disservice. And I, I can't stress enough how much I distance myself from the politics of this, this discussion. Yeah. I mean, I, I was on an interview yesterday with, with a South African delegate to one of the UN groups, and she was adamant that this was racism, she was adamant that this was sexism, and so forth. And I don't think that conceptually it is. I disagree with much of the IWF's position. I strongly disagree with the evidence that they're using to support their position. But I can't bring myself to disagree with the concept of what they're trying to do, the principle and the theory behind what they're trying to do. And to call it racism to me shuts the conversation down. You know what the problem there is that when your first reaction is a knee jerk or a shoot from the hip because you're fired up and emotional and you blame racism, then you, you pretty much go down a cul-de-sac and you can't engage with the detail in a constructive way. So yeah. I suppose our job for the next 45 minutes to an hour is to try and move that stuff aside and actually talk about the substance so that we can, we can be constructive about pros and cons. Well, let's talk about the substance. Um, the things that you talked about often in your writings leading up to this decision is the idea of concept versus evidence. Um, concept being that in terms of the IWF, they're trying to protect the integrity of female sport, particularly in athletics. And let's not forget that this decision is probably going to move towards the IOC will probably adopt a similar policy. It could affect women's sport, you know, not just in athletics. And the evidence is obviously the scientific evidence that your team brought and Casa Semeni's team brought to that uh, court of arbitration. But can you just explain that concept versus evidence thing? Because it is quite complex. But if you don't understand that, you probably don't understand the debate. Yeah, and you, don't, you can't understand the decision because my simple read of the decision is that Cass has weighed the, com the concept more heavily than the evidence. In other words, they've got these two conflicting issues and they've said which one matters more, theory, evidence, they've gone theory, that's how they made the decision. It's the only way you can explain it. So, four or five years ago, there was no evidence because no studies had ever been done in this population, DSDs, 
to try and understand performance advantages that might be unfair. So all you had was two sides that were arguing over theories. Mm. Now, the IWF theory was, and I'm, I'll try and summarize this point by point, is number one, men and women compete separately for a very good biological reason. The main factor causing the biological difference between men and women is testosterone because of what it does to the body after adolescence. Therefore, if women have elevated height or elevated levels of testosterone by virtue of one of a few conditions collectively resulting in what are called DSDs, differences of sex development, those women have an unfair advantage and should be compelled to lower their testosterone. The rest of the world was saying, well, so what? Natural advantage is natural advantage. Leave it alone. It's discriminatory and so forth. And the two sides were basically arguing back and forth. Yeah. And in 2015, CAS changed the debate. They put there what, what to me anyway personally is a watershed because they said it's fine. It's all good and well. You say X, you say Y. Someone bring me evidence. And that leads us to this court case. So this court case becomes an argument about whether there is evidence to support the theory. So the IWF have held fast to their theory. Semenya has held fast to hers. And the IWF are obliged to provide enough evidence to support their position. And that is basically what the week in Lausanne was dedicated towards doing. But just taking a step back, so when the IWF brought this evidence, they brought it in late uh, 2018, and that's when this court, when this court case kind of started the whole process of this. I mean, let's let's just take a little almost back to the start of this. In two thousand nine, when Casta Semenya first arrived on the scene, she was winning the African Championship. She went on to win the World Championships. She went through a, a tough time in the mid two thousands because of changes to her body because she was forced to take this medication. She challenged it. Lots of things have happened since. But now we're at a point where it was that decision that kind of said, if you are above five nanomoles per liter. You're therefore illegal. You're not able to compete as a woman in female events. Not all female events, right? Not all female or events. For this latest policy. Yeah. So this was the key difference. So the, the DSD regulation is not in its first iteration. This is its second or third version. So the first one came just after Semenya in 2009. That, that policy was basically moved aside by the court decision in 2015 in which they said, we, we agree with your concept, but now you must bring us evidence. And the, the words that Cass used are the numbers matter. Literally, that's in that legal decision. Yeah. The numbers matter. The magnitude is important, right? So now the IWF went off to collect their evidence. And over the course of from 2014 up to 2017, there are scientific papers that show you what this evidence is. The end result of that evidence is that the new policy comes out in April 2018 it no longer covers all female events. It only covers 400, 400 hurdles, 800, and the 1500 mile combination. So when people saw that, they said, whoa, hang on. This is clearly an anti caster Semenya policy. Yep. And that, that attitude, I've seen that a lot in the last few days, is that it's because of that selection of events, it must be targeted at Semenya. So just to support your argument, even Caster herself has uh, tweeted uh, over this uh, controversy. I think for that, in fact she's tweeted this yesterday. I know that the IWF's regulations have always been targeted, have always targeted me specifically. For a decade, the IWF has tried to slow me down. but This has actually made me stronger. The decision of the CAS will not hold me back. I will once again rise above and continue to inspire young women and athletes in South Africa and around the world. So even Caster, who is obviously very involved in this case, has taken it quite personally because it's not a leap of faith to suggest that, that this is aimed at her to some extent yeah and i yeah, i can understand that i mean yeah. would you would you Absolutely. take it it's hard not to take it personally if you were involved yeah, yeah. i mean it, it is it for her it is personal it's yeah. not in her interest to worry about the five or six other people she's the one who has to take the medicine she's the one who has to change her career plans so of course it's personal i don't think that it's targeted mm. It's personal, so, but it's not personal. Yeah, it's, it's a broader, right. broader thing. Yeah. So the, the the way that it's played out, it it affects her most publicly, but I don't think that it's targeted at her. It's not like a group of people have sat down and said, right, mm -hmm. these are the events she runs, these are the events we'll regulate. And what I would be at pains to explain is that the reason the policy only covers those events is because. When the IAAF was mandated to go away and bring back research, 
they were effectively painted into a corner where their new policy had to be led by evidence. So when they did their study, 2011-2013 research study at their world championships, the only events where they found an effect of testosterone were the 400, the 400 hurdles, and the 800 mm. on the track. They also found hammer throw and pole vault, but they didn't have any women with these medical conditions in those events. So they said, well, that means it's a, a false positive. It's not a real finding. So we're going to discard the field events, and we're going to say 400, 400 hurdles, 800. Because they, they couldn't add other events because mm. they didn't have the evidence. They only had it for those events. Then they added the 1500. Now that looks, depending on your mood and your perspective, <laughs> that looks malicious towards Semenya. Absolutely. The IWF's argument is that so many athletes run both the 800 and the 15 that it would be absurd not to cover that set of events. So then they added the 1500 despite not having evidence. So, so and the cause of arbitration for sports, in fact, make it make yeah. a, a recommendation to the IWF not to include that mile um, 1500 meter event. We'll get it a bit later. We'll talk about the reaction of the IWF and particularly Seb Co to that. Yeah. But th th it was a point of contention even in, in the decision of, of CAS. Yeah, so there's a suggestion by CAS that the IWF consider taking the 1500 out because yeah. there was no evidence. But the point was the IWF took one step after the next, one, two, three. And by the time they looked up, having been mandated to create an evidence-based policy, the foundation for this regulation had to be evidence. The only events for which they had evidence were the four, eight, and 400 hurdles, yeah. plus, and we'll get to this, the 15. So that's why it's those events. It wasn't, it wasn't because they arbitrarily targeted Semenya. It's because that's where the evidence led them. The problem with that, and this, I think this is a significant problem, is that it creates a massive paradox for the model. Because the IWF's model is that high testosterone, by virtue of having testes and being genetically male, gives you male-like advantages. Okay, that's fine when we compare men to women. It's true. Men are 10 to 12% faster than women from the 100 all the way to the marathon. Long jump, high jump. In other words, it doesn't matter whether your event lasts two seconds or two hours. Testosterone gives men such a large advantage that we have to separate them. But the, the key is testosterone does not discriminate. When the East German, Eastern Bloc, some American sprinters, athletes in the 1980s were doping using testosterone, they got better at every single event. Yeah. Not just the 4 and the 8 and the 15. Testosterone does not discriminate. But now you've got a policy where your theory is that it does because mm. how can it not cover all the events yeah. so in my opinion the IWF's own evidence contradicts its own model <laughs> and therefore it creates this untenable internal it creates almost an untenable internal inconsistency yeah. that I think undermines its integrity because the, the absurd situation is that if there was a, a, a meeting over a weekend Casta Sigmania could run the 5,000 on a Friday, no problem. Yeah. She could run the 200 on the Saturday, no problem. But to run an 800 or a 1,500 on the Sunday, now she's not eligible. Yeah. Why? Oh, because she's biologically getting the advantages of a man. But not in a five, not in a two? That's yeah. absurd. It's, it's preposterous and wacky, and it completely undermines the theory. So that's the one problem with the, the IWF's argument. The second one, which you've written about extensively, is, is the fact that they're only using testosterone as the measure. In other words, if you have high, high testosterone levels and you and I have the same high testosterone levels, we're going to be equally strong and athletic. But that's, testosterone is not necessarily, it's how you use the testosterone that is the measure of how effective it is as a, as a, as a hormone. Yeah, so testosterone is the is the leading man or the leading woman. Maybe I shouldn't use these these pronouns. The leading uh, role player in this discussion. So the the first question there you might ask is how did we come to the point that testosterone is the target? If you go back decades, the issue of men versus women and gender verification was done by a simple physical exam. Women used to have to be physically examined by a panel of doctors who would then decide if you were female or male. Now, 
that you can imagine. I mean, that's that's extraordinary to yeah, think. Talk that's, about human rights issues. Cool. That's and that's within our parents' lifetimes. That's what was happening. Yeah. Then, then for good reasons, they said this is no good. And so they moved on to the next candidate, which was genetics. And they said, if you have a male chromosome set compared to a female, that's what we're going to do. So if you were XY, you were male. If you were XX, you were female. So that sounds great in theory because you can very easily split the world into males and females. The problem is that sometimes you get XY, male genetically, but they can't use... Or male chromosomally. Yes, yeah, let's, yeah, yeah. so let's be precise. Yeah. Chromosomally male, yeah. which means they have the gene, it's called the SRY gene, on that Y chromosome that's going to send the signals to become male. Yeah. So what happens next is you have the chromosome, the gene. You form the testes. You produce the testosterone. The testosterone does its business, which is to generate your male reproductive organs and later in life what are called the male secondary sex characteristics. Deepening of the voice, hair growth, none of which is relevant to sport, but muscle mass, yeah. less fat mass, shape of the skeleton, strength of the skeleton, cardiovascular capacity, hemoglobin. Now, even a basic understanding of physiology tells you that that list of things makes a big difference to performance. So, so the point was it goes genetics, hormone, biology, performance. Which is the IWF argument. Which is the IWF argument. The problem in some people is that they, are, they meet the first step criteria, genetically, chromosomally male, but they can't use the hormone. So they've got all the testosterone in the world, but it has no benefit. And they develop as female. So that's why the genetics argument failed, was because there's a small group of people who meet the one criteria but not the other. And so they moved on and they said, all right, let's look next at testosterone. So it's taken us a couple of minutes, but we've got now to the point of understanding why testosterone is the candidate here. So that what sports authorities now are saying is we're going to measure testosterone. Why? Because in theory, men have much higher levels of testosterone than women. Yep. In theory, testosterone is one of the primary determinants of the biology that makes men superior at sport compared to women, yep. and therefore it's a good candidate. It's a surrogate marker of the biological sex that matters for performance. And then just look at those numbers. So this 5 nanomoles per liter is the number that the IWF have used. Previously it was 10 nanomoles per liter. Just give us an idea of where men and women sit on that nanomoles per liter right, amount. So in the absence of quote unquote pathology, in other words, in normal typical development and, and the situation, women lie between almost zero, so 0 0.7 and about 2.7 nanomoles. And the men's range runs from about 7.98 all the way up to the 30s. So the lower limit for men in a normal circumstance is higher than the upper limit for women. The IWF's own research found that 99% of women lie under three. So that fits more or less with that argument. Yeah. And there were other studies where they reckon there's a one in 10,000 chance that you'll be above five. And that's due to certain medical conditions, polycystic ovary syndrome and so forth. So they figured that the concentration of testosterone was a good marker. The theoretical problem, and you alluded to this two questions back, is that concentration alone isn't all that matters. Yeah. Two people can have the same levels and have vastly different effects of that level. So you can't, you can't judge based on that number only what the biology of the mm. testosterone mm. is, which, which is why you can look at that mm. in the opposite direction. So you can say, okay, Usain Bolt compared to you or me, there's no guarantee his testosterone is higher than ours, even though in every respect of biology, he is... He's physically mm, superior to superior us. Superior to <laughs> us, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the analogy I heard the other day was it's about like having a tank of petrol. So we all have maybe 20 liters of petrol in, in our car, and one of us has a V8 engine, the other one has a, has a, has a sort of a two-liter engine. And, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's how you use the testosterone, how you use that fuel, and that's the, that's the difference. So is it fair to say that the IWF have kind of ignored that argument, and that's the argument that Castor and your team brought to the table in this court case? I, I don't know if they'd have if ignored it so much as glossed over it accidentally, potentially. 
And there's an important concept here that I'd like to get into in a moment. Um, our argument was, yes, very much that testosterone alone doesn't do the job. And again, you can find cases of people who have incredibly high testosterone levels, but who derive no benefit from it because they are insensitive. And so when we talk about these DSDs, important point is that a DSD is, is kind of a catch-all phrase to describe what is basically in the outcome. Yeah. But the cause is any number of medical conditions. And one of those conditions is called complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. So an androgen is a male-making hormone, andro-male, gen genesis. And testosterone is the main androgen, and that's got a couple of, call them family members. Now, what happens in these people is that they have testosterone, and it's like the key that unlocks a door, but their locks don't work. So the yeah. receptor for testosterone is faulty or, or absent, and so therefore they get no effect of testosterone. Now, conceptually, there is no basis at all to include that condition in the regulations. So that's a problem. If you then move the needle slightly further to the left or right, whatever, you get a condition called partial androgen insensitivity. So now you can use testosterone, but not in the normal way. The problem you've got now is how do you decide how much is too much? How so partial do you need to be in order to be female yeah. versus male? And so now there's a real problem of scientific objectivity and accuracy of diagnosis and understanding that that uh, potential advantage so you could argue that PAIS should be removed from the regulation because it would appear arbitrary as to whether you think the person has enough advantage so in the case I mean I look at from an, an outsider's perspective and uh, not a scientific perspective but in the case of Castor it seems that she's we don't know what her medical pathology is exactly, but we know that she has obviously a DST because that's where we've had this case. But partial seems to be the most likely reason why she is able to do this. In other words, she hasn't developed fully because she has that Y chromosome, but she has developed some characteristics which give her some sort of muscular advantage. I mean, she is a strong person. She's she's bigger than most most women, and you know she looks obviously slightly more male than than a, than a woman would. So, would you? Yeah. Is it a fair thing to say that? about her i um, think one has to be careful there that you're not entering a world of almost confirmation bias mm. there are many athletes who are as muscular who you wouldn't who you wouldn't necessarily say that about and there are many athletes who have one of this set of dsds who might be as sensitive but you wouldn't notice so in both directions you could have a call it a false positive and a false negative and one of the key legal arguments here is how do you identify these cases do you have to look at them and judge them based on their physical appearance? Because yeah. I could give you five athletes and ask you which of these has this condition, and I guarantee you it's not 100% accurate. So one of the interesting um, paragraphs in the decision by, the, by Cass which says that athletes with 46XY DSD have testosterone levels well into the male range. And then it talks a little bit, goes on to say, and who experience a material androgenizing effect from that enhanced testosterone level to reduce their national testosterone levels to below five nanomoles, whatever. But it's basically what it's saying is that you should be able to see somebody that it has an effect on. And what you're saying, it's almost impossible to actually see that because I've made the mistake of saying she looks muscular, but actually that might not be because the results of testosterone. She could have the same testosterone as somebody who doesn't necessarily look that way, but she just uses it more effectively. Um, and that's that's really the crux of it, that this weird space about uh, an, who experience a material androgenizing effect, it's almost subjective in many ways. Yeah, so two things to that. One is you, you, can, ma you can simplify a little bit by making it binary. Does I'm trying she... hard to simplify it. That's yeah, the, yeah. yeah, it's difficult. And the whole, the whole issue boils down to the simplification of male versus female. We need binary categories in sport. We yeah. need you to compete either in women's events or men's events. But the biology is too complex to be neatly dis divided in that way in not many people, but in a small number of people. So, so on this issue, can the person use testosterone, yes or no? We can ask it like that. And you can say, yes, they clearly can, or no, they can't. But that's, that's not really enough. What you should be asking is how much can they use it? Because you're trying to establish where on a spectrum the advantage might lie. Now, theoretically, the advantage lies between 0% and 12%. 0% yeah. 
in the case that the person has high testosterone. So let's go from the beginning. The person is chromosomally male, XY. They have testes. The testes are producing testosterone. Now, they either can't use all of it, as in they're insensitive. And then there's another medical condition, by the way, called alpha-5 reductase deficiency, where they, they can't convert testosterone to something else. And that has knock-on effects. So it's not just how sensitive you are. It's also how you can use it sideways, right? Yeah. So you see this person and you say, right, they meet this criteria, this one, this one, this one. Now, can they use the testosterone, yes or no? That person, if they can use it fully, as if they were male, would have a 10 to 12% advantage, theoretically. Yeah. If they can't use it at all, it's naught. The problem now is you've got to put somewhere on that line, you've got to drop your pin. And you've got to say the advantage is this. And it matters because if you can't quantify it as a theoretical advantage, then you can't evaluate it against the downsides, the risks, the balance yeah. of rights. And that's my biggest objection here is... When we ask the same question of men versus women, men have, without question, a 10 to 12% advantage. So we know what the magnitude is. I would argue that in a DSD athlete, we don't know where from 0 to 12 that advantage lies. Mm. It's definitely there. And I don't want to be under any illusions. Semenya and other athletes like her with those conditions probably have significant advantages but I don't know how big it is. And so therefore I can't interpret what it means and I can't justify regulating it. And that's exactly what you guys brought as Caster's team to the Court of Arbitration, yeah. is that this evidence doesn't substantiate this performance benefit. And until such time as they can, you can't regulate it. Exactly. Because it's messy. Exactly. Yeah. So when you said earlier, did the IWF ignore it or gloss over it, there's an important point which some listeners might think is semantic and I hope, I hope I can explain it so that you understand that it's not. If you say Castor Semenya has a biological advantage of 10 to 12% or X percent because she has male-like biology, that's a different statement from saying that the theoretical potential advantage for someone like Castor Semenya is 6 7%, right? Because yeah. in one of them, you're allowing for the person to not get there. In the other one, you're saying the advantage is there. Imagine we framed that and said that Mike has a 10 to 12% advantage compared to Kate. Yeah. No one would disagree with you. But they, sorry, Mike may have a 10 to 12% advantage compared to Kate. The theoretical difference between Kate Mike and Kate. be my wife, Kate, just in case you don't know. Yes. <laughs> the theoretical difference between Mike and Kate is 12% due to testosterone. That's a theoretical argument. The problem if you say the difference between Mike and Kate is 12%. Because there's no proof of that. Because there's... Because Unless there's no, you actually take our performances and do a whole series of tests. There's no proof that you are getting all of that 12%. Yeah. Yeah. But there's no doubt that you could. You could, right? So therefore, it's more accurate to say you may have a theoretical advantage of 10 yeah. to 12%. The problem if you say that Mike has a 10 to 12% advantage over Kate is that you've created what is actually an easily falsifiable theory. Because now all I have to do is go away and find a man who doesn't have a 10% advantage compared to a woman, <laughs> and I can say, look, this person proves that the advantage is not 10 to 12%. Yeah. And you'd be astonished how many people do that. Yeah. They, they will go and they will find, a, find men who are slower than women, and they'll say, well, this guy's got high testosterone, he's not faster than the woman, therefore testosterone doesn't work. So... Yeah. If you want to be biologically accurate, you have to talk about the theoretical advantage that men enjoy over women is 10 to 12%, and therefore we have to regulate it. You can't pin that theoretical advantage down in a DSD, and that's why you can't regulate it, in my opinion. So I, I guess this is an impossible thing to achieve, but if you could find out if some sort of test was done down the line where you could actually figure out what how an athlete uses the testosterone available, it is a probably, a, a, if there's any way of doing this a fair way, that's the only fair way to do it, saying you have X amount of testosterone, you use X amount, therefore you are you have an advantage, a, a, an evidence-based advantage rather than just a theoretical one. Yes. In theory, you can do that in the same way that someone who is uh, being diagnosed as diabetic goes for tests and they work out how sensitive you are to the hormone insulin. So... It's, it's probably theoretically possible to do that. I don't know how long it'll take to get there. 
the problem then is what do you do with that? Yeah. Because I guarantee you there'll be an overlap between men and women in that respect. So there will be some women with low testosterone but high effect and some men with high testosterone, low effect. And when you look at the two populations, there'll be a lot of overlap. So it becomes almost irrelevant as a, as a candidate for regulation. The reason testosterone was attractive is because the level of it is theoretically totally distinct between men and women. Yeah. Coming up... You can have something discriminatory, but it has to be reasonable, necessary, and proportional. So let's move on to the gender versus sex debate, and that's the sort of a second part of this this decision. Um, we were talking off air about the, the idea of testosterone levels being um, that this measure. So, for instance, if I was going to decide that uh, for ten months I was going to take medication that would reduce my testosterone below this five nanoboles per liter that the IWF are proposing, um, theoretically, could I then line up at the start of a woman's race and race it? You'd be two months premature. You oh, said 12, ten months. Ten months. I thought it was twelve. You, yeah. you, you need twelve months. Twelve months. And that's that's covered in a regulation for transgender male to female athletes. So. Any human being, any sorry, let's let's do that again. Any man can reassign or re-identify as a woman, and can compete in sport, provided they show that their testosterone levels have been under f at the moment ten. It'll probably change to five fairly soon, thanks to this decision, and they will then be allowed to compete as women. So the only requirement to compete in women's sport is that you have to declare yourself female. You don't need legally to be recognized as a woman. You just have to self-declare and you have to lower your testosterone below 10, soon to be 5, for 12 months. Yeah. For an athlete with a DSD, the concept is similar. You have to lower your testosterone to below 5, but for 6 months. That's really, that's really where these two policies overlap. Where they differ, and that's important, is they apply to completely different populations. But the, the, the transgender issue is a big deal. I think it's the next big battleground for sport. And it wouldn't surprise me if, if the fear of men competing as women has, has permeated the way we think about Casta Semenya and that ultimately has swayed this decision because they're so fearful mm. that an army of men is going to start entering and running as women. And that fear has been bound up into this DSD issue. When I look at um, you know, world-renowned scientist and lawyer Paula Radcliffe talking in the media about these issues, she keeps talking about transgender men, women, and DSDs in the same sentence. And to me, that conflates the issues unfairly, uh, ignorantly, maliciously, I don't know. But they are separate. But it's all about testosterone. So let's just define this, this gender versus sex, because I think that's kind of the, the nub of the, the wider discussion around this. So gender is how people identify themselves. So we talk, you know, we talk, talk about how many gender, gender identification options there are on Facebook, for instance, something like 70 different ones. Um, sex is the biology, gender mm -hmm. is the identification of yourself. So it's important to recognize the difference between those two terms. Exactly. And then as pertains to our discussion, we ask why does sport have men and female categories? Is that a gender differentiation? Do we divide them into genders or do we divide athletes into biological sex categories? Yeah, and I think what's key is that the, we've seen some of the ramblings on, online with some of the uh, columnists, on, in fact, on a local site here, they talked a bit about her. she grew up as a woman, she is a woman, therefore she, why can't she compete as a woman? So understanding, people, people, understanding that people say they identify as women, therefore they have to run as women it is not the science. This is, this is the, that's such a difference between the sex versus gender debate. Yeah, there's no doubt that self-identification doesn't work uh, yeah. because men would then be able to self-identify as women without any intervention at all, and women would basically disappear from elite sport if that was allowed to happen. Now, that's the transgender fear. Again, can't stress enough, this is the DSD issue, yeah. and because these are different populations, I don't think that the same logic should be applied. So the logic that is applied to regulating men who want to change to become women is fine. And if there was a court case, by the way, in the next few months where a male, a biological male was arguing that they should be allowed to run in women's sport without alteration, 
I would be 100% in the side of the IAAF. Mm -hmm. I would gladly testify on their behalf about how important testosterone is and all these things we spoke about, the theoretical advantage of 10 to 12%. But that's not what this is. Yeah. This is an argument about a set of conditions where that person cannot, by definition, use testosterone. Something has not worked. And whatever that thing is affects the theoretical argument about how much performance benefit they get. If, if they could use testosterone, they wouldn't exist as a DSD. Yeah. So the point is they can't use it in a number of different ways. So therefore, we shouldn't talk about them as if they're biological males. Yeah. So the big uh, question that, that has been raised in many different platforms and media, particularly in South Africa, and because we're, you know, South Africans get very uh, worked up about this thing because it feels so personal to us, is is this about castosomenia or about this wider issue? Now, you might say, well, we've talked about this issue. It's not about castosomenia, but we, we, we alluded it slightly at the start of this conversation, this podcast, talking about the fact that it's aimed at certain events around her. And we've also now got uh, the the, the um, uh, Sebco talking about the fact that he was asked if he was going to take the recommendation of the, of CAS in allowing this fifteen hundred meter mile event not to be included in this regulation. Does it feel to you like it's a CASTA thing at all? I can see that it ultimately lands on her shoulders more heavily than on anyone else's, but I don't think it was designed to do that. I think that's the outcome, not its intention. So I think there's a distinction between those two things. And we've, I tried to explain earlier why the events covered uh, just happened to be hers. I think it was because they were bound by a mandate to come back with evidence for the regs. And the only evidence they could find happened to be hers, in part because of her. You know, yeah. they, Because the study they did, by the way, is they went to the world champs and they looked at every female competitor's performance and their testosterone level. And they tried to link those two together. And what they ended up finding is that if you were in the high testosterone group, so in other words, if you were in the top level for testosterone, your performance was better than in the low testosterone group in those specific events. And so they write a paper which basically concludes that there is evidence for an advantage of testosterone in those events. Yeah. Another person might have sat down, by the way, and written that same paper with a headline, absence of effect of testosterone in 17 out of 22 women's track and field events because yeah. that's the, that's the reality they found an effect and said yes we've succeeded i looked at that and said they looked for an event and no they failed i remember reading the study and going is this it is, mm. is this all you've got yeah a small effect in four or five events yeah. That's not good enough. And there are some data points which were questionable in this research. Well, that, that, so, that, <laughs> so that comes later. So then, yeah. then a colleague, now a friend of mine in Colorado, sends me an email. He says, listen, he's looking at the stats in this paper, and some of it looks a bit dubious. What, is it, what do I reckon? He and I request the data, and we have a crack at it ourselves and start looking into it. So we did that. We, we emailed the, um, the authors of that paper, and this is said, the IAAF paper that was released last year. Yeah, and this yep. it was I think it might have been published in 26, 17, oh, okay. 17. But this was the paper that comes directly out of the, the previous court case decision. Remember that Cass said, numbers matter, find us the evidence. Yep. This paper is that evidence. Right. So and it's not studying DSDs, it's studying women with high versus women with low. So that's that's substan that's quite different. But nevertheless, we get the data and we look at it and we say, this is unbelievable because in their data set, they've got performances that didn't happen. So for instance, there's a time, let's say 201.32 in the 800. And we're looking in those world championships, that time wasn't run. So that's either a typo or it's an error or it's a duplication. I don't, I don't know. I can't explain it. We called it a phantom time. It's quite a serious um, well, issue. In, in, I mean, so, making a typo in something like this is a serious. And so it wasn't problem. just one yeah. typo. Like yeah. we we looked at some events. They didn't send us all the data. They sent us some events, and we found that between seventeen and thirty percent, I think it was. Let's let's far let's to be safe. Let me call it seventeen to twenty odd percent yeah. of their data was actually erroneous. Duplication of times, omission of some athletes' times, phantom times. And the bottom line was that we didn't believe that the conclusions from that paper were trustworthy 
because we didn't think that the data was trustworthy. And so in, in April, May and June last year, Roger from Colorado, myself and a Norwegian uh, scientist who is, is a pretty big researcher outside of sports science, but he got involved. We wrote a paper suggesting or basically demanding that that scientific study be retracted from publication, which is a big deal. And it was, it was just personally, that was my, my debate and my involvement there is what got me into the Castor Semenya's defense for, for CAS. Because to some extent, when the, when the debate around Castor Semenya started, you were almost on the side of the IAAF in terms of protecting women's thought. But this change and this evidence has led you to almost change your mind about the evidence that yeah. is available. About the evidence. So for me, I see the separation between theory and evidence. Yeah. And I, I still I stand by the theory of the advantage. And you're an evidence guy, we know this. <laughs> yeah, I'm, t- I'm trying to be. I mean, of course, we all have biases and so forth. And mm. I remember watching and writing articles about Semenya saying that I'm fully on the side of the IWF, these athletes should be banned and so forth. And the watershed for me was looking at that evidence. As I said, I, I looked at it and I was like, I just, I can't, is this all you got? Yeah. Surely, surely there's more. And then when the regulation comes out and it only covers some events, that makes it, in my opinion, significantly weaker than it used to cover. Mm. And it makes people get emotional about the fact that it seems aimed at one person. Yeah, so which now, is it the looks, question. now it looks arbitrary, yeah. it looks targeted, it looks twice as discriminatory as it did before because before it was at least applied to all women, now it's applied to some women. And then you go say, well, on what basis? And that's where yeah. it falls short. So that the evidence was a massive watershed. The, the struggles we had, by the way, getting that data, and we wrote in our paper how difficult it was to get that data, and we criticized the lack of transparency around this. Because, you see, for good governance, there has to be transparency. And this is universally a problem in sport. You think about anti-doping as well. The transparency is appalling. Whereas, in the, and, and similarly in this issue... We tried to get the data. We really struggled to get that data. And eventually we concluded that this, this study, which really does underpin the regulations, was so flawed that uh, it should have been retracted and therefore the regulations shouldn't stand. One of the interesting uh, points in this decision by CAS was they talk about the difficulties of impl- implementation of the DST regulations. So we talked at, right at the start of this podcast about the sort of slightly schizophrenic nature of this uh, decision because, yes, they're saying we want to protect the sport. The IWF has brought enough evidence for us to be satisfied, but how are you going to implement this in a way that is fair and actually does in, not only protect the, the sport itself but also the athletes that are potentially in harm's way here? Exactly. So one of the, you know, we spoke a little earlier about the the allegation that the policy is racist. And I I reject as a concept that the IWF are racist to try and do this. I don't don't believe they're targeting a particular racial group. However, on the implementation side, when you actually deliver the regulation, there is considerable potential for it to look and potentially be racist. And that's because you have to identify these cases based on physical appearance. Yeah. So there's a real possibility there of subject of judgment, which can be racially biased. And then the reality is that this policy will affect athletes who are African more than it will affect them from the rest of the world because there's good reason to believe that these medical conditions are more common, more prevalent in Africa. So on those grounds, I can see real issues for human rights, and racism and discrimination once you start actually doing it. I, I still, to reiterate, I still reject that it's racist as a concept, but I can, I can see why people feel aggrieved on the other side of it. Coming up. The use of these drugs presents with risks of potentially contravening ethics in order to obey the policy. So the last couple of days, we've seen the World Medical Association come out in uh, in a very controversial, well, I wouldn't say controversial, but a very clear directive about doctors now now have to potentially give this medication to athletes like Castor Semenya. Ross, just tell us a bit, a bit about that decision, and we're going to be playing an interview very shortly with somebody you spoke to who can give us a bit more clarity on where doctors sit in this big space. Yeah, so this issue relates to once the athlete is identified as having a DSD, and has to lower their testosterone, they've got to go 
through one of three medical processes. One of those is surgery to remove the internal testes. If you do that, obviously testosterone all but disappears. The second option is you can have an injection of a drug that blocks your testosterone production. And the third option is that you can take oral contraceptives to lower your testosterone levels. Now, those two medical options in particular are crucial to understanding the case. And this was, I spoke earlier about my first watershed was the data. My second watershed was understanding a little bit about the medical risks because the use of these drugs presents with risks. Any woman who's ever taken the pill or oral contraceptives will tell you that sometimes the side effects are a little bit unpleasant. In this instance, you might have to take much higher dosages and you might have to take them permanently for years and years and years. You can't stop because if you stop and your testosterone level goes back up, then you're ineligible. So yeah. the, the policy basically compels these people to take high dose for a reason that the drug is not intended. So that's called off-label use. And what the World Medical Association came out and said is that they believe that to be medically unethical. And they, in fact, encouraged their doctors to not implement this policy. And that was a couple of weeks ago. And then yesterday afternoon, I saw again a similar statement. And I just want to try and read that to you so that I get it right. They say the World Medical Association has reiterated its advice to physicians around the world to take no part in implementing new eligibility regulations for classifying female athletes. Now, that's potentially massive because yeah. if the World Medical Association says that and the signatories to the World Medical Association, which would be, for instance, the South African Medical Association and others around the world comply with that, then doctors who are covered and registered with those organizations are potentially contravening ethics in order to obey the policy. And that's got massive implications for insurance, for medical ethics, for legal considerations, potentially criminal charges if something goes wrong. And so it, it bottom line is it means that the, the policy might be impossible to actually implement because doctors won't do it. So when we spoke all the time about the risks, and we, uh, I remember we identified elevated risk of thrombolytic events, you've just mentioned osteoporosis. Any one of those risks to Cassis Mania or any other athlete, the doctor who prescribes it, what you're saying here, is liable because of the off-label use, the fact that the WMA have urged doctors not to comply with it, and so the combination of ethics and legal issues here stands to potentially cripple a doctor who goes with this policy. Correct, because it's protection body, because they have been seen as negligent behavior, and, and it would be the reasonable man test that is not reasonable, and the medical protection society will, will, say, will wash their hands with you. They'll say, this is not what we, um, we, we insured you for. We insured you for looking after patients and to practice medicine that's evidence-based, and we insure you in God forbid something goes wrong. Not when you practice off-label use, unevidence-based, for no health care benefits. Sorry for you, bye. You can deal with the court. So that was Professor Mark Blockman, the university from the University of Cape Town, the chairman of the Human Research Ethics Committee. And it just shows the impact of this on the doctors, because essentially what he's saying, if you go down this road of actually helping athletes take, well, helping them, but giving athletes medication that's off-label, you there's, there's a lot of repercussions involved. Yeah, so the, the fundamental issue here is that there is no medical precedent or protocol for, the, for what is done to these athletes. And the bottom line then is that you're taking a healthy person, an elite healthy athlete, and you're turning them into patients. And you don't know whether the policy works, the, the, sorry, whether the medical intervention works. You don't know whether it's safe or not. It's never been studied. So yeah. there are no standardized medical protocols which will then influence what is off-label use of potentially harmful drugs. Now, it's important there that you heard his voice and not mine, because I'm not in the business of prescribing drugs, whereas he is. Yeah. And he has, has a better understanding of the medical ethics than, than I would. But their voice, those doctors, to me, seems extremely significant. And I noted again that Cass recognized that in its decision. So they, they, they mentioned at one point in the decision that there are issues that may arise in the future. I think it's the third of the three points, they say, where, which goes towards the proportionality here of the intervention. But they, they, they don't seem to weight it 
as much as certainly I do and as much as someone like uh, Professor Mark Blockman did there. It says the side effects of hormonal treatment, this is point three, the side effects of hormonal treatment experienced by individuals, by individual athletes could, with further evidence, demonstrate the, uh, the practical impossibility of compliance, which could in turn lead to a different conclusion. Is that kind of what they're saying, that it's difficult when they take these medications? And as you've said previously, taking this medication doesn't necessarily guarantee that they are going to become better or worse athletes because as we've already found out in this podcast testosterone is not the the the, the actual conclusion of this and even if they take this medication the side effects of the medication could be the reason for the lack of performance not the testosterone diary yeah exactly so what's going to happen almost invariably here is that any athlete who lowers their testosterone will get worse right yeah because testosterone is so important to the biology of performance it increases muscle mass so now Castosomania's muscle mass goes down. It reduces fat mass, and so now the fat mass will go up. It's responsible for hemoglobin, so now the hemoglobin levels come down. Those three things alone will impact performance negatively. Yeah. The, the problem is that let's say, for argument's sake, Castosomania gets 4 to 5% slower. It's still quite difficult to quantify why she slowed down. Is it the direct effect of having less testosterone, or is it the effect caused by the, the, the drug that she's taking to lower the testosterone. So you don't know whether it's indirect or direct. And it's also difficult to control because her body, over the course of 28 years, has a set point for how much it needs. And now you're denying it what's normal for her system. So the, the situation is complex. I suspect that all these athletes will slow down. Yeah. The IWF will say, look, that validates our policy. Because if they all slow down by... 5 to 7%, the IWF will say, well, that's how big the advantage was. We were quite right. Yeah. I'm not sure that that's entirely true. But even if it is, there's still a medical issue around whether you can justify the potential risks based on this advantage. So just taking a little step back, the World Medical Association Directive, am I right in saying that one of the big issues here is that even if Castor is going to take this medication, decides to take the medication, potentially there is nobody to administer this medication. Right, because any doctor who wants to be compliant with the ethical guidelines set out, as advised in this instance by that association, as agreed to by the South African Medical Association, would say, Castor, I can't in good conscience, having yeah. sworn an oath to look after your health and your beneficence and your well-being, I can't do this. Because yeah. what if something goes wrong. And the things that can go wrong are drastic. I mean, you can cause severe osteoporosis potentially. You can, you can cause, these drugs can cause thrombolytic events, basically clots, which can be fatal. And just on that, athletes are already at significantly increased risk for clots. People who fly are at significantly increased risks for clots. And so the combination of those two things plus this, the, the point is the risk might be one in... 500, it might be one in 5,000, I don't yeah. know. But it's a risk that need not exist because these are not unhealthy people. They're healthy athletes who are being made into patients by regulation. And, and the counter argument to this is, well, you know, we have to do it. We can't always know exactly what's going to happen. You can't run a human biological experiment as part of a sports governance policy. Last time we did human experiments on people, it didn't end well. I mean, it is. It, we, we remind ourselves a little bit of this because it is kind of an experiment of humans and again, with untested well, drug use. And yeah, again, yeah. don't take my word for it. You heard yeah. it from from the medical ethical mm. expert there, yeah. Prof. Blockman. Uh, that that's exactly what this is. It's yeah. uh, in the absence of these protocols, dosages, safety, side effects. Mm. This is experimental with risk of harm. And I don't believe enough benefit. You haven't shown the upside, you know. And so when Cass says it's discriminatory, fine. Key point there is you can have something discriminatory, mm. but it has to be reasonable, necessary, and proportional. Mm. I don't think it's necessary because of the lack of evidence, and I certainly don't think it's proportional because of what we've been discussing now. So I suppose the question when it comes to Cass's seminia, I'm not asking you to put some conjecture on this, but... She's up against it. She's in a, a catch-22 position. She, she potentially can't take medication. 
or she has to move up to events which are not suitable to her. I mean, she might be a bit competitive in the 5,000 metres, as we saw at the South African Championships a couple of weeks ago. She beat a very good athlete in Dominic Scott. But um, is there a way, is that the end of Casta Semenya's career, do you think? I know you hate thinking about these things, but no, the hypothesis, I, is, it, is, it, <laughs> is it a no-win situation for her? I don't hate thinking. I love thinking about these things because it's a cool opinion and it's cool to hypothesize. And there's so many, by the way, purely if, if, we, if we could remove ourselves from discussing it as involved, it would be unbelievably fascinating over the next while to look at what happens, you know? Uh, if she runs the 5,000 and she can be... Uh, yeah, she can succeed enough to go to the diamond leagues and so forth. Maybe once in a while, in a, in a slower tactical race, she can she can win some titles and medals. I don't know. I'd be very surprised if she's anything like as world class and dominant there as she is in the eight hundred. It would yeah. be actually borderline unprecedented to be as dominant over that spectrum of events. You know, the the four hundred eight hundred is physiologically quite different to the five. And when you look at the top East Africans now running in the low 14s, sub-14, 30, I don't know that Castus Semenya will get down there, but maybe she'll prove me wrong. So as a 5,000-meter runner, I suspect she'll be very good but not great. Um, I guess she would have been hoping that the IAAF took up the court's decision to take the 1,500 off, but... Sebastian Coe certainly put an end to that one. <laughs> well, that was happened just, uh, in fact, it was, I think, in the in the newspapers this morning. Um, Sebastian Coe asked whether he was going to take this regulation and his answer was not very complicated. He just said no, which yeah. is quite a cold response to something that uh, was, you know, something very emotional for lots of people. Yeah, but of course, if you're Sebastian Coe or the IAAF and someone asks uh, Lord Coe, would, uh, would you consider taking the 1500 off because there's no evidence? You're not going to discuss that because yeah. there's no evidence. Yeah. So it undermines your position because yeah. you've, you've implemented a policy that's weak in the absence of evidence, but you're going to tell the world you've got evidence. Yeah. So he's, he's caught in a classic bind there because he can't explain it. So, of course, he's got one word. <laughs> and, and the thing is, those people would have sat down at some point and said, right, we're going to add the 15 a year ago. Yeah. And they didn't add that thing arbitrarily. They did it for a very good reason. And so when Cass makes a polite suggestion to please change it, given that Cass has no authority over them to force them to change it, yeah. they'll say, ha ha, thanks, no. Not much goodwill, I sense, in that respect. I mean, I'm being a bit harsh well, on the IWF and to suggest that there's, if they did say, okay, we actually take your point, there's not enough evidence here, let's make the 1500 a mile part, not part of these regulations. No, there's no desire to compromise. Mm. Um, and that... That's, I suppose it weakens their position in some respect. It, it, it does because yeah. it's a confession that you don't have evidence. And if you don't have evidence in the eight, then in my opinion, it puts the sorry. Yeah. If you don't have the evidence in the fifteen hundred, then it puts the eight hundred, the four hundred back into the spotlight. And yeah. you say, well, how's your evidence there? Not very good. Yeah. But let's uh, yeah. actually. So no, we'd they'd rather shut that conversation down super fast. And the problem, yeah, it's. The thing is, they are utterly convinced of the merits of their argument. They believe this to be so necessary to protect women's sport that they are uncompromising in their intent, which, you know, in other circumstances you would say is noble, you know, steadfast in principle. That's what they're being. It's just their, their principle is on a flimsy foundation, in my opinion. Still to come. As the IAAF, you do have an obligation to ensure fairness but you haven't met the standards necessary. Your science isn't robust and of a high enough quality. So I'm gonna give you a little bit more time. So one of the critical, um, I guess, criticisms of these decisions and this issue around the advantage of testosterone and all the, uh, mentioned, the benefits we've mentioned already is that, how is this different from Michael Phelps having big feet and basketball players being tall? Um, is it not just a, a physical advantage that she has over other athletes? Yeah, I've seen this argument for years. Since 2009, people say sport is all about genetic advantages. How can you take away one person's but you're not worried about Phelps's long arms, big feet, low lactate, tall players in basketball? I understand what those people are getting at, but I don't think that it's a relevant argument for a couple of reasons. One is that we don't have a category in swimming for small feet. We don't have a category in swimming for short arms. We don't have a basketball competition for short people 
who are yeah. disadvantaged. Obviously, yeah. they are. We all agree that height matters in basketball. So why don't we protect short basketball players? Why don't we say that if you're 175 or shorter, you need, quote, unquote, performance protection. So here's your separate category. Now, to some extent, that is arbitrary. Yeah. But the creation of women's sport separate from men's sport is not arbitrary. It's biological and necessary because the difference between men and women is so enormous that without separation, women would disappear. Now, what that means is that women's sport exists as a protected category. And if you, ha if you have a line separating one group from another and that group needs protection in terms of its performances, you have to kind of defend that line. Because we don't have a line for short arms and small feet and short people, it's actually irrelevant whether Phelps has... Phelps, Phelps's arms could be so long that he could tie his shoelaces without bending down. It wouldn't matter because there's no category to protect the guy who can't, yeah. right? So it's actually an irrelevant argument. It's a non-starter in that respect. The other reason it's different is because when we look at testosterone and performance, and so many people get this messed up, in my opinion, they'll look at athletes with low testosterone who are better than athletes with high testosterone, and they'll say, oh, well, that shows that it's not all about testosterone. Nobody is pretending that it's all about testosterone. What we are saying is that testosterone is necessary to compete at the highest human levels that males reach. If you don't have testosterone and its effects, you cannot be an elite male athlete. Because testosterone at upper levels and in taken illegally is illegal. Well, that's why it's <laughs> on the list of doping is because it has such powerful effects on performance that we, we've decided to stop people using it artificially. Yeah. So testosterone is necessary but not sufficient. In other words, you and I have it, but we're nowhere near elite athletes in any sport, right? So it's like you should think about testosterone as the thing that gets you through the door. But once you're in the room, now all the other stuff matters. So VO2 max is the amount of oxygen a runner can use. It's a function of their cardiovascular system and their muscles and how much oxygen they can take in and use. If you looked at VO2 max across the world's population, Elite athletes have a much higher VO2 max than non-elite athletes. But if you looked at VO2 max in all the people who ran the London Marathon elite race last weekend, the difference between Elliot Kipchoge and the guy who comes 10th might be non-existent because other factors matter once you look at a narrow population. Does that make sense? So in other words, yeah. once you're an elite athlete, you already have a higher to, high VO2 max, and so now other things start to play a role. It's the same in basketball. If you looked at the height of NBA players, it doesn't predict performance. But that's because everyone is tall. It's the top 1% of people in yeah. terms of height. So therefore, the effect, the, the variable you're looking for's effect disappears because it's already present in every single person. Right? So that's a really important concept. Now, having low testosterone in this instance is the disadvantage. Having small feet is the disadvantage. Having short arms is the disadvantage. Point one is we don't regulate the arms and the feet. But point two is that all things being equal, having short, uh, short arms or small feet, you're not going to come 4,000th in the world. You know, In other words, the effect that having the disadvantage makes is not that big. I guarantee you, having no testosterone or benefits of testosterone like women don't, that's worth thousands and thousands of places in the world. So the best women are in the thousands in the world rankings because of the absence of that. So conceptually, theoretically, qualitatively, it's different. And by the numbers, testosterone is much more powerful than having long arms or big feet. I guess one of the best examples of that is the Paralympics because in many ways right. they are protecting segments. So, you, for instance, in the cerebral, cerebral palsy division, there will be four or five divisions of the severity of cerebral palsy in the division. So there is precedence for protecting segments of the athletic population. That's obviously a very specific one. Paralympics is the best example because you get different severities, therefore different negative impacts on performance. And what we've decided is we're going to divide cerebral palsy into three categories for let's say for running t36 37 38 the problem is it's very difficult to tell them apart yeah. you know the difference between a 37 and a 38 is sometimes quite subtle and you'll get someone who's less affected 
running down or more affected running up. So that causes controversy. So it's, it's the most similar. But the point is, if you're protecting someone who has disadvantages, you have to figure out how you do it. We don't protect people with small feet and short arms, so that it's irrelevant. Yeah. So I suppose the final question is, what is the future of this debate? Is it, is it over? Um, is there lots more still to come? Um, do, is there a solution to this issue? Well, it seems, it seems it'll rage on and on, certainly in South Africa. Uh, the rest of the world will move on quicker than we will, um, because I think we've got more invested in it, obviously. If she goes the legal route, then it, then it goes on a lot longer. I don't know enough about what that involves, other than to speculate that it probably involves a lot of time, uh, and it might involve a lot of money, and a lot of energy, and uh, potentially a different set of arguments, because I'm not sure that the next step on appeal revisits the same set of evidence. Of course, they're all germane and relevant all the time, but it might go more in a human rights... If you go to the European Human Rights Court, they're not going to be as interested in the nuance of testosterone in men yeah. versus women, you know. So that, that's, that's an area where it might change the legal focus a little bit. If she doesn't go for the appeal and she keeps running, does she stay at the same event and slow down? How much? There'll, be, there'll, there'll certainly be interesting things to discuss around this issue in the future. If this medical issue that we've been discussing and this World Medical Association, and we heard from uh, Mark Blockman, if, if that gathers enough momentum, that threatens to potentially blow this thing in another legal direction. Yeah. And so maybe that's what comes next. But, I mean, it's been 10 years, you know, why would it end now? Theoretical solutions, are there any? If I was king or judge for a day, I would have said, look, look, I get your concept and I'm still sympathetic. As the IAAF, you do have an obligation to ensure fairness. But you haven't met the standards necessary. Your science isn't robust and of a high enough quality. So I'm going to give you a little bit more time. But I'm going to give you three to five years because I don't want you to come back here with bad science. So if it's going to take you five years, you take five years. Yeah. But the key point here is you can't do it yourself. You can't ask, you can't ask the IAAF to gather research to support its own policy when the IAAF has shown that it is absolutely steadfast in its belief. Because yeah. you're asking them to confirm their own bias. It's like asking a cigarette company to do research to show that cigarettes are safe. What do you think they're going to do? <laughs> so whatever research is done... you can twist done, research any way you want, really. Even good research can be twisted. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So it wouldn't be the first time mm. that, that not, I don't want to say corrupt, but conflicted research has changed what we think to be true. So I think that the court should have said, look, you've got five years but you've got to get independent research done. Now, the research is hell of a difficult. I'm not going to pretend that it's easy because you're trying to answer the unanswerable because how do you compare Casta Semenya with high testosterone to Casta without? She doesn't exist as that person unless you medicate, but then as we've seen, the medicines might have such severe side effects. So it's a, it's a super tough study to do, but I would say that you've got to do it independently You've got to put together a steering group of people who are independent of the IAAF and you've got five years to come back here to disprove that DSDs have an advantage and then we can talk again. Until that time, you let people compete where they identify unless they change. So if someone is born male and decides later in life to run as a woman, then you can intervene. Then you can have them yeah. reduce their testosterone. But if someone's born a girl and is, and I hate to use this word because it, it, it just sounds so relativistic, if someone is enough of a girl to be raised by her family and her community as a girl and she becomes a woman and, a, and an adult woman, I don't think you can tell that person that they were wrong. Yeah. And so therefore they stay where they were born mm. unless they change. Then you can intervene. Yeah. That's, that's what my uh, alternative solution would be until the evidence becomes so strong. What, what evidence, I've thought about this a lot in the last two months, what evidence would be strong enough? If a woman one day got the full benefits of testosterone, one day we will see a woman running 145 for an 800. Yeah. And then everyone will go, wow, and now it's obvious. Now we know that we have to do something here. But until that time, you know, when we look at Casta Semenya, she's dominant, 
But Castor Semenya's average margin of victory is 1%. Yeah. The biggest margin of victory that Semenya has achieved in a Diamond League or a World or an Olympic race is 2.1%. So she's only getting a 2% advantage, where in theory she could have had a 10 to 12. Does that mean that she's just actually a lesser athlete with the benefit? I don't know, but you can't convince me of that. And until you can, you've got to leave it the way it is. That's a great summary, particularly that last uh, thing you just said. It's, it is interesting that she is not competing with men. She is still just better than women and nowhere near those um, male standards. Professor Rostock, it's been a fascinating discussion, our third podcast in our series, Science of Sport. Don't forget you can interact with us on Twitter, Science uh, Sports Sci Pod, Sports, and then SCI Pod. Also, Ross is on Science of Sport, and my uh, handle on Twitter is Mike Finch SA. You can interact with us. Let us know what you think about a podcast. We're always interested to investigate subjects that you're interested in. And, of course, this debate, I suspect, will go on for a long, long time, and it probably won't be the first time we will do this podcast. Ross, thank you very much for your time, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Science of Sport podcast. Follow us on Twitter at SportsciPod.